Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christina Bain, and I am broadcasting from uh, Babson College here in the United States. I want to thank all of you for joining us today for our third webinar in the series, The Human Trafficking Organized Crime Nexus Intersections, Vulnerabilities, and Analysis for the Private Sector. Uh, our topic today is going to be on human trafficking in the extractive industry and looking at the illicit mining sector. Uh, we're going to be talking about environmental degradation, environmental crime, and also human rights challenges. And we have a terrific lineup of panelists that are going to be joining us. And I just want to make a note of some changes in our program today. We originally had uh, two colleagues from the United States government, uh, Heidi and Martin, who are now unable to join us today due to scheduling challenges. So we will be having another speaker, and that will be my colleague and co-host, for this webinar series, Livia Wagner from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime and the RESPECT Initiative, and she's going to be talking about her work uh, on illegal gold mining in Latin America. So thank you, Livia, for being willing to present, and we look forward to your presentation. Otherwise, all of the other speakers will remain the same in, the, uh, in, in terms of the speakers lineup. So I now want to thank, uh, in addition to our, our RESPECT co-host, and you're going to be hearing a little bit more about the RESPECT initiative from my colleague, Livia, in a few minutes, uh, but I also want to thank the Terrorism, Transnational Crime, and Corruption Center at George Mason University, and my dear friend and mentor, Dr. Louise Shelley, who I know is joining us today uh, from, uh, from Virginia. Uh, and also uh, Kate Kerr and other colleagues at Track who have also helped to make this webinar series possible. They're terrific partners and want to thank their great work. Also wanted to mention that Track is now a center of um, intelligence expertise and through the Department of Homeland Security. It's called SENA, um, and it's a Center for Network Intelligence and Analysis, and we're very excited that the Terrorism, Transnational Crime, and Corruption Center has been given this honor, and we look forward to more work and projects that's going to be coming out of TRAC due to this new collaboration with the Department of Homeland Security. So thank you to TRAC. And before I introduce our, our moderator, I just want to go over a, a bit of the, the technical pieces for our, our webinar. Um, and one of the things that we're going to be doing today is we're going to be utilizing our chat box a lot. And the chat box is going to be where we're going to be communicating. You'll see it on the lower right-hand side of your screen. And if you have any technical problems you can't hear, you're not able to uh, hear or, or access the platform in any way, something has gone wrong, please communicate with us here. In addition, you can also communicate questions. As soon as each of the presenters uh, start to give their presentations, please start to text in your questions. Uh, we will be having a, uh, a robust discussion at the final part of the, uh, of the webinar uh, today, and you'll, we'll get to all of your questions in as they come. So do continue to send those in as each speaker presents and as you think of the questions, and we'll be monitoring, monitoring them before I am where we are. So uh, actually, before we go to our moderator, I want to introduce my colleague, Livia Wagner, uh, who is the Respect Coordinator and Private Sector Advisor uh, for the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, is going to give us an introductory uh, talk on the Respect Initiative and introduce the work that we're doing, which this webinar series is, is, a, is the heart and soul of part of the work that, that we're doing, and uh, she's going to explain a little bit more about how we're all collaborating on this really exciting new initiative. And to give you some background on Livia, um, her work with uh, the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime has been covering mainly the issue of human trafficking, but also looking at business partnerships as well as transnational organized crime issues with a sp specific focus on Latin America. Uh, she previously has worked as a private sector focal point for the United Nations Global Initiative to Fight Human Trafficking, or UN GIFT. This is actually where Livia and I 
uh, met when she was at UN Gift and we started doing webinars together and, and the rest is history. Uh, she's also worked as a civil servant for the Austrian Foreign Ministry in the Department of Development Cooperation, concentrating specifically on African countries. Uh, she also has private sector work experience in the travel and tourism sector and has worked for expat, uh, which is a, a very a well-known uh, and a prominent anti-trafficking organization globally that fights specifically child trafficking within the, looking within the, tra the travel and tourism sector and uh, global child sex tourism. Uh, so she worked there and looking specifically at combating the commercial sexual exploitation of children. Uh, and she is also the member, a member of the Austrian Association for Sociology and she's authored numerous publications. So, Livia, the floor is yours to explain the RESPECT initiative. Hi, Christina. Thank you very much um, for this very kind introduction. Um, I'm sorry, that I'm a bit husky, um, but uh, I'm going to do my best to, come to give you a brief overview of the RESPECT um, initiative. So, yeah. As Christina was saying, we have met um, in our different capacities and we, in our former um, assignment, we said that the, the anti-trafficking communities develop very great um, tools and publications and a lot of, of useful instruments and, um, and the private sector is becoming increasingly a more prominent um, stakeholder and has more responsibility and also mitigating the risk of that. So um, together with also um, IOM, the UN Migration um, Agency, we have developed RESPECT, the Responsible and Ethical Private Sector Coalition Against Trafficking. And um, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of this now. Can everybody see now that I'm switching the slides? Christina, can you see that? <clears throat> it's great, we can see you, Livia. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, yeah, as I was saying, um, these three organizations, the Global Initiative, which I'm working for, um, plus IOM and Baptist, we have joined our forces um, to create this initiative and um, to create the Respect in Initiative as an incubator to foster debate on thought leaders, um, but also giving other um, stakeholder groups the opportunity to connect um, with the anti-trafficking community. So at the moment, um, what I can tell you is that the RESPECT initiative is offering a very, very um, exciting resource center. So at the moment, it's the first of its own um, resource center that exists, compiling all the information, everything that has been produced that is relevant for the private sector on human trafficking, specifically looking at labor exploitation. So I really invite everybody to have a look at um, the resource center, which is on the, web, on the website of respect.international. And there you can find all the information groups by different areas, um, industries, but also supply chain segments. And um, just have a visit, just go there, and um, you can see also the, not only material, but also, for instance, technical solutions, legal frameworks, and so on. Um, but beyond that, the Respect Initiative also wants to be as I was saying before, a peer exchange platform um, to share knowledge and good practices and to also develop some industry specific case studies um, and to also give some guidance where it's needed from the private sector. Um, here again, is, you can see the resource center with um, a brief snap snapshot how this is looking. And um, I invite you also, also the private sector companies to bring to our attention if you have specific good practices or anything you would like to share. We're very happy to receive um, all the different material. Um, then another big activity of the RESPECT initiative are the webinar series. So this current webinar series is already the fourth one. We started in 2015. So we will have concluded by that um, 24 webinars by inviting 96 speakers from private sector, law enforcement, civil society, governmental institutions, media, and of course, um, academia. So um, as you can see, every webinar series have been, has been looking at a different overarching topic. 
The current one is looking at um, human trafficking and organized crime, but there are lots of intersections between these two areas. And um, we have also an increasing um, or a growing, growing audience from um, governmental institutions. And usually we have around 150 and 200 registrants around the world. So, yeah, the current one is, as I was saying, it's looking at transnational organized crime and the one that we're having today, which is looking at um, environmental crime and human trafficking and the mining sector. It shows that uh, human trafficking cannot be looked at in a silo because it always connects to other forms of organized crime, which is the nature um, that you have different crimes being aligned to human trafficking, which makes the private sector even more vulnerable um, because it doesn't have to deal only with one issue, but with several at the same time. Um, the next one is going to be on illegal fishing, which is going to be in April, then on tobacco in May and cybercrime and online exploitation in June. So we invite you to stay tuned to our webinars and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Livia, and thank you for your partnership and, and work on the RESPECT initiative. So exciting to see this develop. Uh, so just wanted to go over one more technical piece. Um, as many of you know who've joined our webinars before, we are recording uh, this webinar. So we will be sharing this with you after the, uh, after the webinar is completed. And each of our webinars are recorded and then placed on the respect.international website. And I've sent, just sent the, the email address to everyone who is on this webinar uh, today. Uh, so do look for the recording. If you have to leave early, we hope you don't. But if you have to leave early, this will be recorded. Uh, and we hope you'll, you'll listen to the recording after. Uh, so now uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Carlos who is going to be moderating our, our webinar today, and we're so excited to have him. Carlos is the Director of Public Policy for the Responsible Business Alliance, uh, and he brings over 12 years of global public policy experience with a focus on sustainability, climate change, international trade, and investment. Uh, he has worked in both the public and private sectors, including helping lead policy advocacy for the International Chamber of Commerce in Paris, and also as a former international trade negotiator at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, he has an M.A. from the School of International Service at American University, and he speaks English, Spanish, and French. So thank you so much, Carlos, for joining us today. And uh, he is going to give us, at first, a overview of the Responsible Business Alliance and then frame our conversation for the discussion. Thank you, Carlos, Christina, very yours. much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, and I hope you can hear me um, well. It's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to join all of you today. So good morning and good afternoon to everyone um, all over that's joining us. Maybe, maybe before I talk a little bit about the Responsible Business Alliance and what we're going to do or what we do, um, I'd like to maybe kind of build on some of Livia's points and, 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 and kind of frame why this discussion and these webinars and this webinar we're having are so important um, from a private sector perspective. Clearly, um, over the past several years, um, but you know, never more present than now, there's an increasing recognition of uh, the risks that companies have across their very complex and very multifaceted supply chains. Um, it's no longer just enough to think about your own operations or your own direct suppliers, but you're really, for a whole variety of reasons, whether it's through governmental uh, policies, regulations, and legislations, and I know some of our, our panelists will talk a little bit more about that, um, certainly civil society, um, investors, business consumers, um, academia, law enforcement, it's simply not enough to not have an understanding and a depth of the challenges um, in your supply chains. I think the issues that we're talking today, which, which or the challenges I would rather say that we're talking today, uh, whether it's environmental degradation, human rights challenges, clearly human trafficking, one of the things that we're all coming to learn is that 
where there's one, there's often another, unfortunately, and many of these things are linked. A lot of times it's, it's happening in countries where maybe the rule of law um, is not what it can be or there's some developmental challenges. So, so certainly something that requires a level of connectivity among government, business, NGOs, civil society, the law enforcement community, academia, and so that's why, again, these things are so important. I think one of the very interesting um, aspects of this webinar is we're going to focus on the extractive industry. Um, which is, which is very much on the ground, literally, um, in dealing with some of these challenges, but really, and very important to us as the RBA, because primarily we work with the downstream industry, um, you know, and I'm gonna explain that in a second, a little bit more what that means, but it's a good example of how both of these um, sectors or both of these areas or parts of a supply chain need to be closely working together to try to address these issues. One can't do it without the other. Um, and, and I think that's one of the things that, that we'll talk a little bit more um, today. Maybe very quickly, what is the RBA? Because we're, we're, we're not that new of an organization, but we've just certainly gone through a name change and, 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 and it's important to kind of remind. Well, basically, RBA is a coalition of some of the world's leading companies working to improve the efficiency, social, ethical, and environmental responsibility in the global supply chains. We're essentially a tool provider uh, for our members um, and giving them a whole range of programs um, and tools uh, that are able to kind of mitigate, detect and mitigate risk in their supply chain. Christina, I'll just ask for the next slide, please. Um, this is a, a slide that reflects our core members. Some of you may know us by our previous name, which was the Electronic Industry Citizenship Coalition. So the RBA was grounded since 2004 um, or launched by electronics companies. I think one of the big things that we did last year was we evolved to recognize that it's not just enough to talk about industry sectors um, in parallel or in silos. They all have to work together to deal with these complex issues. So as you see there, we've begun to work with companies in the retail sector, companies in the um, in the automotive um, and the toy sector have all joined to kind of work through this program to push for um, the continuous improvement across their supply chains. Next slide. Christina. And as we're talking about um, different different going past electronics and looking at different sectors, um, I, I wanted to highlight one particular initiative that we have, which is called the Responsible Minerals Initiative, which actually hosts about 360 companies. Um, and the response, because we're talking about the extractive industry, but the Responsible Minerals Initiative, which was formerly the Conflict Resourcing Initiative, um, is really a whole set of tools that the downstream industry has developed, obviously working in many cases with um, upstream industry partners to help deal with conflict-affected risk, or initially started with conflict-affected risk in their supply chain, and is now expanded to begin to develop a suite of tools and risk assessments to begin to look at things such as human rights abuses related to cobalt sourcing in the Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as develop um, a place where companies can come together and talk and share practices and develop things to see where some of the uh, emerging risks are. We also um, last year launched something called the Responsible Labor Initiative, which looks at forced labor a little bit more closely, and again, is multi-industry and multi-stakeholder as well. Uh, last slide, uh, Christina. And this one is just a kind of um, some statistics on, on the depth and the breadth of the organization, both in terms of the membership, but also in terms of the work that we have done. So again, for us, I think this panel and this webinar comes at a very timely moment because we're seeing that these risks are increasingly interconnected, increasingly growing, and increasingly becoming more difficult to challenge. So only through cooperation, um, which I think this panel will be able to show um, is the way to address them. So maybe with that, I'm going to introduce our First panelist, um, I think Christina mentioned a bit the um, overview of how we hope to um, to run the panel. Um, but we're going to go with each panelist, and then we'll have an opportunity to have a full discussion later on. So please use the chat box feature as much as you can, and also just a reminder to please keep yourself on mute because um, uh, this will help obviously when our panelists are speaking. So I have the honor to introduce Christina Duranti, who is the director for the Good Shepherd International Foundation. Christina graduated in 1999 from Siena University in Communications and Economics, and I got her PhD in Economics of Information from the University of Florence as a researcher and consultant for Italian universities and government agencies in economic policy, economics of public goods, management of nonprofit organizations. She worked as a fundraiser and project manager for EU-funded programs in Italy, Belgium, and the United Kingdom. In 2007, she was hired by the Good Shepherd Sisters to set up the Mission Development Office in Rome 
and was incorporated in 2008 as the Good Shepherd International Foundation. In this role, Christina has visited many Good Shepherd projects in the Global South, organizing capacity building programs for Good Shepherd sisters and staff in South Africa, Lebanon, Thailand, Kenya, and contributed to the development of an international network of offices to manage projects in Egypt, Kenya, Madagascar, South Africa, Angola, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan, Lebanon, Syria, Thailand, India, Indonesia, Philippines, Burkina Faso, Mozambique, Bolivia, Honduras, Guatemala, and Nicaragua. Certainly a very impressive resume. Um, so Christina, with that, I will pass the floor to you. Thank you very much, and uh, very nice to join this group. Um, I just met Christina Bain uh, a few days ago here in Rome, and it was very interesting to see the uh, overlapping interest in the issue of the supply chain of cobalt. We, uh, we are currently uh, coordinating a um, program in DRC, specifically in the cobalt mining area of Lualaba. Uh, the capital of this area is called Kowesi, and this is where our Good Shepherd program is based, and it's known as the Bombuster program. So I had the, an opportunity to share about the current situation of the extractive industry in Kowesi and the human rights abuses that are um, still happening at the source of the cobalt supply chain, uh, specifically on child labor <clears throat> that is still prevalent in the cobalt mining areas, in the artisanal cobalt mining areas, and I've shared with the group the results that our program has uh, been able to deliver in the past five years, specifically in these areas of forced labor, uh, child labor, and other violations within uh, the extractive industry. So mm, the title of my presentation is Ending the Exploitation Against Children and Women in the Global Capital of the Cobalt War Strategies and Risks. We have uh, clearly um, identified the situation in the area where we work in DRC as currently the capital of the global, uh, the, the cobalt um, extracted industry. Um, I don't know how familiar is the rest of the audience to the specifics of the cobalt um, supply chain, but um, at the moment more than 50% of the global cobalt that uh, is critical for the um, electronics and automotive uh, batteries mostly is extracted and comes from um, from this specific area. It's a very concentrated area where most of the global um, uh, cobalt comes from. Um, so what we've observed in the past f uh, five years, it's an actual rush to cobalt, very similar to what we remember from the gold rush. And the effects on the local communities have been quite um, alarming from the point of view of human rights violations, especially on the most vulnerable. We have uh, sort of um, identified the situation of the communities uh, living around the cobalt mines in, uh, in Kowesi and in Lualaba as a poster child for what is well known among economists as the resource course, uh, but adapted to the modern era. That's why we labeled it as the resource course 4.0 poster child, uh, what's happening in Kowesi. How can we say this? We have observed that um, at, outside of a very exploitative mining system, there's almost no alternative livelihoods for those who are not interested in working in, in the mines. Uh, there's several, um, uh, ev there's a lot of evidence that oligopolies and cartels are operating, and they're mostly um, run or 
or related to international groups that in the absence of an effective uh, regulatory system set most of the rules and the prices, agriculture and services are definitely underdeveloped, so much so that food security is a big issue because most of the uh, basic goods, including uh, staples, are imported and uh, unaffordable for the poorest members of the community. We have observed that uh, specifically due to the um, the way the artisanal mining sector is under-regulated in this area, there's currently a sort of uber mining model uh, that has taken place, which is exacerbating the uh, poor living condition of the communities and perpetuating socioeconomic inequalities. Um, why do we say this? Because we've seen that even for large investors who are currently among the key uh, suppliers at international level of cobalt um, on the ground that really uh, invested uh, minimally and they have very limited direct employment and they exploit a very large uneducated and virtually unlimited freelance workforce, what is called the cruisers, the uh, freelance miners. There's very minimal supervision on, on actual implementation of the OECD guidelines on um, uh, the mining um, the, the uh, principles on um, sustainable mining and human rights violations are pretty clear and um, open air, let's say. Uh, the social investments by large traders and international corporations um, that we have observed are also minimal in terms of infrastructures and community development, which is all um, a provision under the national law, the mining code, and the OECD guidelines on responsible mining. So systems to prevent and prosecute human rights violations we have observed are weak, uh, both at the local level level and in terms of international um, monitoring and mostly uh, corrupted. So while the global markets pushed the value of cobalt 100% high in the past 18 months, in Kuwait we kept observing uh, child widespread child labor and other forms of human rights violations that I'm going to list here. This is a these are results from a research we did in 2012 when we uh, began our, our project, and it's based on a sample um, in, collected in a village outside uh, the town of Kowesi. And this is a mining area outside Kowesi. So you can see that violations of fundamental children's rights were widespread. So 70% of the children that we interviewed were engaged in labor, either directly in mining or in all the activities that are related to mining, like washing and crushing and caring um, and quarrying. And this caused trauma, long-term health hazards. Um, the majority of these children, almost 100%, uh, were illiterate and uh, most of them are orphans, 50%, over 50% are orphans or unattended. Uh, most of these are over orphans caused by accidents in the mines. So uh, one or both parents killed in uh, incidents uh, within the, the mines. Um, when we arrived, there were really no referral systems in place for prevention of prosecutions of abuses on children and to attend uh, specifically the orphans and vulnerable children. We found a uh, staggering uh, prevalence of sexual and gender-based violence in and around the mining sites and in the mining communities uh, with 100% of the women and girls we interviewed reporting abuses happening within the mines. But uh, to some extent even more um, uh, disrupted is the fact that uh, these girls and women ha had no skills to be employed in anything else but uh, sex work or to be engaged in forced marriage uh, as the only sources of in income. Um, associated to that, uh, we found a very high birth mortality rate due to the absence of uh, proper um, 
healthcare systems and even uh, basic healthcare services within these communities. Uh, hunger and poverty in respect to a system that generates immense wealth are so prevalent within um, the, the communities with uh, most of the children. These were data from 2012 that could not recall the last time they had meals and the nature of the income that comes from artisanal mining, which is unpredictable unpredictable and intermittent. And as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the underdeveloped agricultural sector the terms, determines really food insecurity for most of the poorest um, members of the community. So this is just to give you an idea, of, uh, visual idea of the, what we're talking about when we talk about asymmetry of information and power within the artisanal mining sector. This is a pile of cobalt and copper that in this, on the streets of this um, artisanal mining community are sold at the same price and with no information of what the actual real market value is. Um, what has our program done in the past five years? Uh, these are some of the key results that we are still in the process of evaluating. Within the target group, uh, that we focused on, we had a reduction in uh, child labor of 92%, and at the moment we have six, uh, 1,674 children enrolled in school and um, in what we call um, psychosocial programs to uh, be engaged in um, uh, meaningful and age-appropriate um, activities. And what is more significant for us is that these children have created their own committees that now advocate for children's rights into other communities, especially on the issues of safety and, um, and, and child labor, explaining to their peers that uh, working in the mines is not safe, is not where children should be, and is we found very effective. Um, we've had the um, families joining um, groups of self-support to um, promote alternative livelihoods, specifically in uh, agriculture. And we've observed that the women and the girls that we focus on have improved their levels of self-confidence, uh, education, and income, which in turn has benefited also their families. We've developed uh, what we call community-based safe spaces where people can report abuses and that can help preventing human rights violations. Um, we've seen that the Child Protection Center where we provide education and, and other services has become a sort of referral point for the community to, um, to bring up um, incidents that happen within the uh, the community. So these are uh, this is a picture of our children in Canina who have drawn their own posters and used this to um, talk to to other children about their rights. You see, the uh, children has the right not to go into the mines, have the right to be protected by the police, have the right to uh, to live with their parents, and there's many more. Um, and so uh, we just had. Um, a study uh, conducted by Professor Canavera from Columbia University CPC Network uh, identifying the key elements of our programs and he um, outlined some of these uh, unique aspects of the strategy for us uh, which I am now uh, reporting to you. Um, he was particularly impressed by uh, the approach of putting the poorest and those who were at the furthest margins first. So he called this radical inclusivity, and this is in the within the spirit of um, the Good Shepherd mission to start from the margins uh, rather than being um, uh, moving from the let's say the local leaders then out to the community. Uh, we develop a program that integrates human rights and development, so trying to provide access to basic human rights like education and um, 
healthcare um, together with the development of sustainable alternative livelihoods. Uh, our team on the ground, uh, led by the Giuseppe Sisters, is very much uh, working on a person-centered approach uh, to development, so putting human dignity first, and this was particularly um, disruptive, let's say, in a positive way, in a very materialistic environment like the one we found in Kuwaiti. The, the focus was uh, both on process and on outcomes in developing the relationship with the communities so that um, I can say there was not a prepackaged uh, solution brought to these communities. It was very much developed on the go and there was a lot of attention on how the relationships were developed, how the services were delivered, and not just to what was delivered. Um, of course, there had to be also a strategic approach on how to engage local and international powers because we found ourselves, although this was not envisioned at the beginning, at the core of this international um, movement uh, interest of the supply chain of cobalt. So we are still working on developing a strategic approach to um, integrate uh, those who hold uh, most of the power and information and the, and the financial means um, in this process of uh, development and, and human rights protection. Although um, there are forces um, well rooted in a very corrupt system that need to be also uh, monitored very, very closely um, to avoid being dragged in. It, we were lucky because the sisters who started the whole process were uh, sort of insiders, outsiders, being Africans from Kenya and speaking Kiswahili, but at the same time not being Congolese, so being recognized as sort of um, uh, local, but at the same time not being entrenched in uh, previous dynamics with the local powers or with the local companies that were not considered particularly credible. We are currently engaged in two initiatives at the international level with the World Economic Forum, uh, what is called now the Global Battery Alliance, where we are trying to provide, to bring our voice, the voice of the communities on uh, how best direct efforts of the, the upstream and downstream companies to um, concretely tackle the issues and provide immediate responses, which should have not been so immediate. So I would be very interested to uh, hear also from Carlos what is his view of this um, international uh, initiatives. Uh, we've observed them from the um, the grassroots, and I would say there's still a lot to do uh, to make them um, effective. So this is uh, this is Catherine, the uh, director of the program, and this is one of the communities where we are um, planning to expand our program in the coming five years. And I would. Hello everyone. So sorry, something has happened to the audio. We're just troubleshooting. We'll be we'll be right back to you.
Okay, what we're going to do until we can get Christina back. Uh, so sorry for the for the challenges with this. Uh, and we'll finish Christina's presentation possibly later later in the program. Uh, what we will do is go to Claire and, and Carlos. I'm going to have you introduce Claire for her presentation, and we'll just move along. Sure. Thank you, Christina. I apologize. Um, Thank you for your patience, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Christina. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead and introduce Claire uh, Larner. Um, Claire is the Director of External Relations for the Newmont Mining Corporation, uh, working in support of, in that role, she works in support of global operations with a focus on external relations and social performance. Uh, prior to joining Newmont, Claire worked as a consultant, assisting clients on a range of issues related to their sustainability performance, including the development of corporate standards, supporting guidance and training, stakeholder engagement strategies, human rights due diligence processes, and sustainability reporting. Uh, before this, Claire spent eight years working with the International Council on Mining and Minerals, a leading organization for sustainable development in the extractive um, sector. So with that, Claire, I'll pass the floor to you. Great, thank you very much, um, Carlos, and, and I'd just like to thank Respect for extending the invitation to be part of this um, great group of webinars. I was really encouraged to see the significant amount of private sector participation that you've had in them. I think um, it's essential that we have a seat at the table, um, especially around these complex issues like human trafficking. It's essential that governments, NGOs, and companies are all um, working together on solutions. So um, as Carlos mentioned, my name is Claire Larner. I lead our human rights program at Newmont, um, and, and I welcome opportunities like this to really clarify the role of the private sector in addressing um, such complex, multifaceted issues like trafficking. We don't have a standalone program on human trafficking at Newmont, though we do consider it to be part of the risks around, um, the whole bucket of risks around modern slavery issues. So as, as you will know, those include forced and child labor um, and debt bondage. And so we, we consider all of those risks um, as, as, as complex and, and particularly um, as we think about how they might manifest themselves in our supply chain. Um, it's, it's very easy for us to think about how we mitigate risks through our direct employees and in our immediate operations, but then thinking about how we manage those issues um, that could be much, much deeper in our supply chain is incredibly complex. And given that, I'm going to flag one of our supply chain um, programs a bit later on. Just to give you a little bit of an overview of Newmont, for those of you that don't know us, we are one of the world's largest gold mining companies. Uh, we've been around for almost 100 years. Uh, we're based in Denver, Colorado, uh, working with approximately 22,500 employees and contractors that support us um, across the whole um, range of mining activities from exploration, development, operations, and, and through closure as well. And you'll see from our uh, purpose and values here that sustainability is really central to everything we do. Um, and we've been honored to be part of the Dow Jones Sustainability Index um, as one of the leaders for the last few years and have been recognized as a well-managed um, company with committed leadership. We have operations, um, you'll see here, in, in four continents, so in North America, South America, Australia, and Africa, um, operations or various um, activities in, in these regions here. Um, you'll note that there's, there's various complexities around some of these contexts that we operate in, and that, um, that's something we take into account with our programs. Just before I go into some of the specifics of, of what we've been working on, I just want to make this distinction between the legal um, and the illegal mining sector. I think um, often the, the mining sector as a whole is considered to be the same um, in all aspects, um, particularly in terms of the, the negative impact that it can have on um, societies and, and communities and, and the environment. Um, so as many of you know, the unregulated illegal mining sector, um, mining is often carried out with uh, little regard for the environment, for um, communities. There can be significant negative impacts on human rights, on health, safety, and security. And often illegal mining activity is carried out um, or organized by criminal groups. Because of this, we see um, the 
the workers at these illegal mines are generally poorer, more marginalized, and often much more vulnerable to issues like human trafficking. Um, I was trying to find recent figures of, of some of the um, some of the figures around I illegal gold mining. It's quite challenging, though. Um, in 2013, just in, in one example, um, estimates from Peru indicate that 28 percent of all gold mined in Peru in 2013 was um, mined illegally, and so that number may well be higher now. There is an excellent report by the NGO Verite. I'm sure many of you are aware of their excellent work. Um, they've produced a report on illegal gold mining and trafficking, and I'd encourage all of you to, to look at that. Um, there's, there's another sector I haven't put on this slide, but the artisanal and small-scale mining sector um, is, can be very different from the illegal sector. Often that's um, a legitimate source of livelihoods, and, and we have a, um, a strong ASM program in New Mountain and have a, a whole strategy around artisanal and small-scale mining, recognizing that where it's legal, so where the governments have legally recognized ASM, and where it's viewed as legitimate by um, communities and, and where the impacts of ASM are, are, are not, um, don't, aren't negative on the environment or on human rights or on the community, it can be a very legitimate source of, of livelihoods for a lot of people. So that's another distinction just to, to think about there. And so then by contrast, um, large uh, regulated companies like Newmont operating in the formal sector and operating legally we um, obviously still face significant challenges. Um, the industry as a whole faces significant challenges. But we do operate within the confines of the law and undergo um, really intense external scrutiny by our stakeholders, and that's, you know, that's a good thing. So just moving on to our um, policy and, and standard commitments, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of some of our policies and standards, just to situate how we approach and address some of these human rights challenges that we see, like, um, like trafficking. And these are important because they really do govern how we operate um, and the behavior that we do not tolerate at Newmont. Um, there is there's a lot of um, a lot of these standards, and they're all available on our website. So I'd encourage you to look at them. I'm just going to give you a, a brief snapshot of them now. Um, so our code of conduct showed here that applies to anyone working um, for us or on our behalf, and it includes a commitment to promoting fundamental human rights. Our sustainability and stakeholder engagement policy outlines our commitment to carrying out human rights due diligence in line with the UN guiding principles. I'm sure. Many of you are familiar with, with that framework. Um, we then elaborate on that commitment in our human rights standard, which reflects the minimum requirements that all of our sites all over the world have to adhere to. An important piece of that is around contract clauses with um, suppliers. So suppliers have to respect human rights in line with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They have to report issues to us that they become aware of in their own supply chains. Um, and then we have 15 other social and environmental standards also all available on our website. And they range from community investment and development requirements to um, local procurement and employment to stakeholder relationship management, um, a stakeholder relationship management standard that importantly includes a requirement for operational level complaints and, and grievance mechanisms. And then we have environmental standards covering topics from water management to closure and, and reclamation. And then um, finally and most significantly, we are about to publish, I hope it's going on our website today, so please check back in um, later, it's not quite posted yet, but we're about to publish our first statement on modern slavery. Um, we don't legally have a requirement to do this yet, we're not um, UK listed, for example, the UK um, Modern Slavery Act applies to companies that are listed in the UK. We don't um, have a legal requirement yet, but we wanted to outline, um, I suppose, the very early stages of our journey in, in thinking about some of these modern slavery risks and, and how we might use our existing programs to address them. Um, so this is the, the first statement that we're publishing, and, and we hope to increase our efforts over the next couple of years, but encourage you to, to check back in later on on that one. Moving on, I'm just going to highlight two of our, well, one, one program um, and some of our targets around human rights, which I think are relevant for this discussion. Um, 
I mentioned that complex and um, the complex supply chains that we have um, covering all of the activities that we undertake from exploration through to, to post closure um, and recognizing that that complexity um, that's you know potentially where certain human rights risks may arise and um, they may be deep in our in our supply chain and recognizing this we began rolling out a supplier risk management program um, it took several years to develop and we started to roll it out this year um, really to apply a much more set of robust standards and processes to um, issues that may arise in our supply chain and so this supplier lifecycle process that you um, that you see here speaks to all the elements of how we pre-qualify suppliers, to how we manage them um, through to close out and, and how we audit or, or monitor their performance on an ongoing basis. Um, and, I'll, and I'll come back to the specific modern slavery considerations that we've tried to feed into this, um, this program. I also just wanted to highlight these public targets that we have set um, for the next three years um, around this program specifically and around building in human rights considerations um, into how we, how we deal with suppliers, um, bearing in mind that that may be where some of the risks are. So um, we now have public targets around screening, training, and the auditing of suppliers based on um, human rights criteria. And see this as a really important way of identifying and managing some of those red flags um, that suppliers may pose and, and building capacity for them to, um, to operate responsibly. So then just thinking about specifically how we have looked at modern slavery risks and how we've tried to integrate, integrate them into this supplier risk management program. Um, at the pre-qualification stage, we'll now be asking new suppliers um, questions and looking for evidence around their human rights record. Um, so we haven't always done this consistently in the past. This is something that we've really built as a fundamental component of that pre-screening piece, pre-qualification stage. We'll also be asking questions around workforce demographics. Um, as many of you know, that's where you can identify potential vulnerabilities um, and potential uh, forced labor issues um, by looking closely at, at those workforce demographics. And then and asking questions around some other indicators of, of forced labor. We'll also be doing uh, risk assessments on the scope of work. So does the actual scope of work that we're looking for suppliers or contractors for um, pose risks? So for example, if we're implementing a construction project or if we suddenly need a significant number of workers, what risks does that pose, um, that, that activity to human rights? Um, and then there are some very specific human rights that we want to make sure we're, we're not impacting, or if there's a potential that we impact them, that we have appropriate mitigations and, and controls in place. So that's fundamental piece of, of, of this supplier risk management work. And then there's a training piece, as I mentioned, um, thinking about our higher risk suppliers, who they might be, and, and the training support that we can provide for them around human rights. Um, and then the auditing, um, so how are we going to audit them to make sure that they are complying with our standards um, and that they are raising any human rights issues that they become aware of. So um, I think I'm running out of time, so I just, I finally just wanted to flag um, that trafficking, like so many of the challenges that the industry faces, is not an issue that we can solve alone. Um, so we really commit to working with others um, through industry associations, through multi-stakeholder initiatives, through groups of thought leaders, uh, particularly when we don't have the answers. Um, and just one example of this, we're a member of the cross-functional human rights working group led by the um, Business for Social Responsibility, so BSR, um, and gain huge value from the experience of other sectors around some very challenging human rights issues. Um, and last year, we supported a joint statement that BSR put together to the Government of Australia, um, really supporting sensible legislation around modern slavery. Um, so that's just one example of, of how we try and work with others um, to, to work through challenges. So I'll end there and just flag um, some of the resources that I, I mentioned. Our social and environmental standards are all on our website. Our sustainability report includes a lot more information on these topics. Um, we have a, a guidance on our human rights approach and some more background on our website. As I mentioned, our modern slavery statement will be coming out very soon. 
Um, and then, then some of those external resources I flagged, the Verite report, the Global Slavery Index, um, uh, the 2017 version isn't out yet, but the 2016 version has a wealth of information about um, broken down by country on um, on very you know real and actual figures around modern slavery. So I'd encourage all of you to to look at that. And I will end there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much. Um, just before we move to our last panelist, I just want to make a couple of announcements. I think Christina, her, as Christina also mentioned, her audio went down, but she'll come back to make any potentially further comments during the Q&A. And I just wanted to remind participants uh, in the audience if, to please send in your questions in the text box, in the text chat box, so that we can kind of, um, so we can kind of begin the Q&A. Um, with that, I think I'll pass the floor over to Livia. Uh, Livia Wagner from Respect. Livia, I think you've already been introduced, so uh, no need for an introduction, but um, go ahead. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, Carlos, thank you very much for this introduction, or the one before. <laughs> um, I'm very pleased um, to be able to present our work on illegal gold mining and the intersections with um, organized crime. So um, before I start, I would also like to thank Verite uh, for their considerable support um, as they have been working with us on shedding the light on issues of human trafficking and, and labor exploitation. Um, so also one thing which was very important for us when doing this work in Latin America, we did two field researches. One was in Peru and the other one was in Colombia was um, to make very clear that there has to be a clear distinction between formal um, versus informal versus illegal or criminal mining. So um, it's extremely important to distinguish between the traditional artisanal small-scale mining uh, or the miners who may work without a license um, and illegal miners or illegal groups um, managing these mines and they could be armed to, could be connected to armed groups or other organized crime groups. So the problem is by failing to make this distinction, um, governments and other stakeholders, they wrongly criminalize informal miners and um, which is also, um, which means like an elimination of the livelihood for highly vulnerable populations. So many Latin American countries, they lack the legislation that clearly delineates the line between informal and illegal mining. Um, and the two countries where we did our field research, Peru and Colombia, they are one of the few countries making this important distinction. So um, I'm starting here to, and these are, um, I'm taking now these findings from our report um, called Organized Crime and the Illegally Mined Gold in Latin America. Um, for that, I was saying we were going to Peru and Colombia, and um, and it was finalized in 2016, and then we did another case study that I'm going to present afterwards. So um, in the region of Latin America, there is a high percentage of gold that is mined um, through criminal exploitation of the gold sector. So at that time, we found out that in Peru, um, approximately 28% were mined illegally, um, in Bolivia, it was about 30%. Ecuador was 77 and in Colombia at that time, it was 80%. Um, of course, the portion of gold being produced also varies from these countries. So um, a few examples um, how this um, criminal exploitation of the gold sector looks like is that, um, for instance, in Colombia until recently when FARC was still um, in these areas active, they obtained 20% of its funding through illegal gold mining. Um, and some of their subgroups, they earned over $1 million per month through the extortion of illegal miners. So now the ELN and the backrooms, the bandos criminales, they also, they control um, illegal mines. And, um, and are involved, of course, in gold laundering and trafficking, um, human trafficking for labor exploitation and for sexual exploitation. Um, in Peru, um, organized crime groups generally do not cooperate with other um, uh, gold mining um, groups or 
criminal gold mining route, but they use, for instance, the same drug um, um, routes for gold trafficking routes. So especially in the area where I've been doing my field research was between Madre de Dios, which is in the south um, east of Peru, near the border of um, Bolivia and Brazil. So this is the, the um, traditional route for drug trafficking and gold trafficking. So, um, but of course in Peru, there are a couple of, or there are just a few organized crime groups that do um, have, or they do merge these operations like the Sanchez Paredes plan, which they operate in the province of La Libertad, which is more in the north. Um, and they own formal gold mines to generate profits um, and launder drug trafficking revenues. Um, but recently, like uh, since last year, um, the Peruvian government has, with the new government, um, which also is not in place since yesterday anymore, but um, the Peruvian administration, they changed their strategies in terms of um, making some of the interdictions and the new, the new government it stopped the interdictions which led to a um, exponential increase in organized crime activities in the illegal mining areas. So that means mine workers, they are hiring hitmen. This is currently the situation. And um, there have been murders of uh, sexually exploited women, but also government officials. At least one person has been killed um, recently in that area. So when it was dangerous to go into that area, um, now it's almost impossible to, to get into these areas because it's very, very um, dangerous. Um, Bolivia is one of the countries that is one of the main hubs to use launder, uh, to use uh, laundered um, gold coming from, from Peru, uh, mainly from the province of, of Puno. And um, these criminal groups, they operate um, in, the, in the legal mines. They use bogus companies for the trade and uh, sometimes they operate also with um, organized crime groups. So. Um, what we have as an effect of um, the illegal gold mining is it's twofold. One are the human costs, that means human trafficking for labor and sexual exploitation, and the second one is um, is environmental crime. So talking about human trafficking, um, this is something, let me just go to the next uh, slide. Um, Human trafficking is rampant in these areas. So you have, um, it's a, an area that uh, where lots of young girls and women are being trafficked to that area. Um, it's basically a um, no man's land. You don't have any presence of law enforcement. Um, you have hardly NGOs going into that. Um, just a couple of health um, organizations are entering these areas um, and women are being exploited to uh, serve the minors and I often call it like a chain of victimization because the minors are being exploited at the same time they are exploiting women and girls and when I'm talking about girls I'm talking about girls of 11, 12, 13 years that I've been seeing there that they are working. I've been talking to girls that they at the time that I was talking to them, they were 15. They arrived there like three years ago. And um, of course, their families, they don't know um, in what situation they are because they have been trafficked from all the different provinces across Peru. Um, and these girls, for instance, they are, um, they are not physically chained to these brothels, but of course, they are not allowed to move Freely, they there are some hours where they can go out, but they have to always pay. For instance, what you can see here on the um, on the picture are like so-called house rules, and um, yeah. So the situation is is really even now it's even more um, more. How can I say? Uh, the situation is increasingly. Um, worse for the girls and um, in other countries for instance in Colombia um, there you also had um, what we found out there were also indicators of forced labor as the the people were not allowed to 
to move out of the of the mining area. Um, in, for instance, in Venezuela, there are also incidents of the Yanomami indigenous community that they have been used by miners um, and they have not been paid anything. So these are like the human costs, which are, um, it's a tragic to see it there and, um, and to see that the levels of, or, or let's say the impact is not just on, on the level of the national, um, of the country, but also on a regional um, area when we come to the environmental crime, when it's about the deforestation. Um, there you can see that this is having an impact on not just, again, not just the country, but as a region as a whole or on a global level when we're talking about a huge um, rate of deforestation. For instance, in Peru, um, the deforestation rate is um, growing relatively or is, is growing in correlation also with gold prices. So that means um, the Amazon um, region is being, uh, ha is having a quite um, direct link of an impact on the gold fever that started in 2008, 2009. And um, also accor according to government officials um, in Madre de Dios only, um, 170 hectares have been deforested in the last years. And, um, Sorry, this was in Peru and just in, in Madre de Dios, it was 50,000 hectares. So um, in, in Colombia, which is also one of the epicenters of deforestation, um, they are mainly located in the illegal mining areas because of course, again, there you don't have any presence of law enforcement or any other government officials, which makes uh, it easier for criminal groups to, to move around and um, to to operate um, in cooperation with other groups. Um, yeah, another another huge impact for um, for the environment is of course the unregulated use of mercury. That means um, uh, normally in the formal mining um, or in the regulated mining sector, um, the use of mercury is um, everything is controlled, but in these um, illegal mining areas, there is no control how much mercury is being used. And there is even now what started an illegal trade of mercury. So um, there are, at the moment, there are different, um, there are different legal frameworks um, addressing the organized crime um, impacts, addressing the environmental impact or addressing um, the human trafficking uh, operations or incidents in that area. However, um, there is what is evolving now is the nature of the transnational crime. That means there are increasingly more operations between the countries, for instance, um, Brazil and Peru or Peru and, and Bolivia. And um, very often the countries prioritize the criminalization um, over the protection of the victims because this is, um, yeah, it's the victims, the rehabilitation of the victims is not very, very high in the agenda. Um, and of course, the environmental, um, the environmental impact um, that the, the, the workers or anybody working in this region or living in this region is also not something that that is being addressed sufficiently at the moment. There are enough studies like the Carnegie Institution um, is having quite interesting and important studies in the region of Madre Dios, but, um, but the governments in the, in the Amazon region are at the moment not sufficiently equipped to address this. Um, yeah, so again, what um, what the weaknesses are in the in the in the responses are also that one huge issue is corruption. So um, very often, the um, or until recently, for the interdictions in Latin America or in in Peru and Colombia, um, 
miners were often much aware of these interdictions, so they um, pulled out the old machinery that was bombed at the end, and then the next day, um, everything was business as usual. So um, this is also one issue that has has to be addressed. Um, another, so what we then said, okay, after having the study done, um, we said, okay, or people were asking me, what is now the, the follow-up activity from your side or what would you recommend? And, um, and one thing we realized that in, these, in this area, there are small but important projects. And one I would like to highlight here is um, the case study of Agrobosque in, in Peru, uh, which is a development response to organized crime in the area of illegal gold mining. And, um, and here we were, thanks to um, Pierre de Zorme Suisse, we were able to have a look at the Agrobosque Agricultural Cooperative um, of fine cocoa supported by Terrorism. And um, this is a project that was founded in 2013 and um, it encourages its members or so the families to cultivate cocoa as a part of, the, um, uh, of a diverse crop yield. So, um, so from these um, cooperative members or families, um, 50% they have previously been or continued to be involved in the illicit gold mining industry because um, the problem with these alternative lively sustainable, uh, sorry, with these um, alternative, alternative um, livelihoods is that the first year, or the first two years, it's very difficult to live from the earnings because this is something that only starts to generate incomes in the year two or year three. So, um, but the but um, the estimations say that the cocoa demand um, far outstrips the, the supply. That means um, key global chocolate manufacturers, including Mars, for instance, they predict a deficit of circa one million metric tons by 2020. So, um, but at the same time, on average, only six percent of the cocoa value chain is received by the farmers. Um, and the vast majority of profits are retained by chocolate manufacturers. So um, just to give you um, an example, the average annual income of Peruvian cocoa farmers is around 1,900 US dollars, which is far below the annual, annual minimum wage of um, oh, approximately 3,000 US dollars. So um, of course, therefore, most of the cocoa farmers or the ones that have been in the illegal gold mining industry at least for um, the beginning of the phase, they are still in, in, in both sectors. Um, so this um, Agrobosque project is currently formed of 54 families, um, which are 350 people. And the cocoa has been targeted by the cooperative as a quality fine product for exportation. And um, the cocoa produced is 80% um, fine native aromatic cocoa, which is um, highly in demand in the international market. And at the time of the case study, we did not have the results, but now um, we, we learned from Terre de Jean Suisse that is, it is being sold to a Swiss um, chocolatier. And um, yeah, so the key incentives for these communities to shift from informal or illegal uh, gold mining or economical structures to formal structures um, are also uh, four points, which are um, longer term security income. That means um, illegal mining brings a lot of profit uh, for short term, but it's very volatile at the same time, depending on, on the global um, gold prices. Um, and the workers also said that they, um, they would like to leave these illegal mining structures um, as a concern for their own future. And, um, and of course, there's also the desire to minimize the environmental impacts because every miner um, does have a direct, um, a direct impact, health impact that he himself or the family um, is, is experiencing. So also avoiding social problems intrinsic to the informal sexual sector, which is the sexual exploitation, 
drug abuse, alcohol abuse, um, gang violence, and so on, um, but also to have a greater access to the market. And um, yeah, so so what then the global initiative was drawing as recommendations based on on our results is that um, it's important to adhere to international recognized due diligence guidelines. There are lots of um, organizations or institutions developing these, and um, but also it's important to disclose these. Um, these standards that a company is adhering to. Um, but also, of course, increasing the purchase of fair trade um, gold that means eliminate as many as possible intermediaries in the supply chain. Um, but also in conduct due diligence processes for all the supply chain segments, um, especially also for the gold suppliers. And, um, and of course, to align operations with national and international legislation and, but also to initiate third party inspections. And, um, but it's also important to enable the traceability of gold and um, also publish the name of gold providers and the due diligence assessment of um, suppliers. Yeah, I think um, I went way beyond my time limit, but uh, yeah, I hope this was useful for you and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Livia, and thank you to all our panelists. I think there's a, there's a lot to um, to consider um, as we kind of quickly dive into the Q and A. Um, I think I've seen a couple of questions that come in that have come in through our um, through our chat box, but maybe I'm going to take this opportunity and I'm going to go back to Christina, who I hope is back on, has been able to fix her technical the technical issues that we may have had. Um, so, Christina, maybe um, quick question one for you is. How supportive has the government been in Good Shepherd's efforts? Um, are they passively responding or have they been actively involved? Initially, they've been very reluctant to engage. And actually, we spent, the, 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 the team on the ground spent the first two years uh, literally sitting outside the office of the province government the, and the mayor of Kuwaiti and this sort of perseverance in the end won some kind of um, credibility maybe from the local um, government and uh, lately I have to say that probably due to the credibility gained um, through within the community there has been a lot more recognition and requests to engage in some initiatives uh, firstly at provincial level you might know that the former Katanga region was split into four provinces and this has led uh, in a process of restructuring all the, the agencies and just recently last year the province has created a child protection um, um, office where we've been invited together with UNICEF and other stakeholders and this is all um, under the framework of the national what it's called the sector initiative to eradicate child labor in DRC. I have to say that there has been some um, recognition, at least up until a couple of years ago, we still heard open denial of child labor in the mines or minimiza minimization, let's say, like it's a cultural phenomenon, it's always happened, it's family related. So lately we have heard some more clear uh, recognition of the problem and some um, at least a formal engagement from the local and national government. Although from the point of view of the actual investment in terms of services and structures, it's been minimal. And I have to say that the international attention that is now uh, on the cobalt supply chain that is casting a light, a strong light on what's happening on the ground has somehow backlashed in the sense that there's now more restrictions in terms of accessing the mines to inspect and monitor even for civil society organizations. It's becoming more and more uh, dangerous and there's uh, not only private guards but also 
public guards that are preventing journalists and civil society organizations to get into the mine. So there's these two faces to the problem. On the, on one end, there's more open commitment, uh, and we're looking at the new mining code also uh, for the provisions regarding child labor and this plan to eradicate child labor by 20, 2015. But on the other end, we see the uh, the fear uh, of disclosing and being transparent. Th thank you, Christina. I think that's certainly a lot to unpack there and and and, and to discuss. As the uh, as as you're right, I think you mentioned earlier, as there's a kind of a proliferation of initiatives, and we're out, we're working on one as well in terms of trying to deal with these issues. And it's interesting to see how that could have sometimes this backlash and shows you the complexity of these issues. Um, maybe I'm going to move to um, Claire and Livia. I'm going to ask both of you this question, and I mean, each of you take it. Maybe I'll go with Claire first and Livia. But um, just how each of you are seeing the intersection of sex and labor trafficking in combination with the mining sector, and how this then relates to the other forms of environmental, other forms of environmental crime like deforestation and wildlife trafficking. So, kind of going back at the heart of this, um, to the heart of this, uh, of this webinar, to see what are what are or not um, the links between the two. So maybe I'll ask um, I'll ask Claire to start, and then maybe Livia, you can offer your thoughts. Yeah, thanks, um, Carlos. And as I mentioned, um, these are not issues that we would see in our immediate operations or with our immediate employees. So the question then is, what does our due diligence look like that gets us deep into the supply chain um, to manage some of these complex issues? Um, and, and the program that I presented really speaks to, to some of that. Um, so, there, so there is that linkage you know, in the in the illegal sector, but um, but figuring out our role as a as a formal and, and listed mining company, and it is a bit more complex. And I think that's where we need to work with others, need to work with governments um, and NGOs to to figure out um, where those risks that may be far removed from us sit, and and how we manage them. Mm. Thank you. Maybe Livia, if you could reflect a, a few moments on that question. Um. Yeah, I think I think this is a very important question here because um, sexual exploitation is happening in all of these areas of um, illegal mining. So um, as Claire was saying, this is something that is not so. I I cannot say for hundred percent it's not happening at all, but um, it's not uh, part of the context of the formal mining areas. Um, but the illegal mining areas, uh, again, are a place where um, you have mainly um, organized crime groups running these um, mines. You have human trafficking, uh, or you have traffickers that cooperate, for instance, with the mine owners because they, they are providing them with the girls that they need for their miners and so on. Um, you have that in the mining area itself, but also in areas of um, like the city that is, is next to it. So I think here, um, we're, and I think this is not endemic only for the mining sector, I think this is in principle something that is happening in any form of extraction where you don't have a lot of um, control, where you don't have governmental presence, uh, law enforcement presence. So um, in the mining area, this is something that you can you can see it because uh, now since the gold fever, there was a rush to this area. And it was also give, um, at, uh, attracting a lot of attention because of the deforestation. If it would only have been for the exploitation of some girls, I have to say, unfortunately, I don't think that this would have um, attracted so much attention. But when you go mm. to these areas, the Amazon is eaten alive. To this. I've flown over this region and it's just incredible to see what is happening there. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia, and thank you for bringing that perspective. Um, I'm going to maybe make a quick comment here, or actually who respond to um, announce a comment that was made that I thought was a very, very important one, which is that it's great that we're making the distinction clear between illegal and formal and formal mining. I think that's for us, I would echo that, and that's a really important thing. It's also very useful to have this kind of data on women 
uh, this disaggregated data on women and how they're affected involved in the act of mining. Um, maybe I'm going to now jump back to Christina. Again, just before um, I do so, I just want to remind everyone that there is plenty of opportunity to engage our very good interesting panelists here on a variety of questions by sending in a question or a comment through the chat box. Um, but Christina, what do you think is the biggest stumbling block to eradicating child labor in the DRC? Um, is it financing? Is it the different approaches? Is it leadership? Is it working with the government? Is it industry support? So it's a very easy question, Christina. <laughs> Please go ahead. <laughs> Actually, I think that all of those who are involved, and I see among the participants to the webinar, someone who's been very involved uh, at all uh, at international levels uh, on this topic. I think we are aware that it's a multifaceted uh, issue, but based on our experience, we've seen that providing alternative livelihoods, concrete opportunities um, for the families of the children to uh, replace the lost income um, and um, an actual access to uh, at least primary, free primary education goes a very long way to eradicate child labor. Of course, together with the enforcement of uh, a regulatory system, but I have to say our community-based um, committees have been quite good at identifying the problem and enrolling the, the families in the, in the program, provided that uh, the families were somehow uh, able to compensate the loss and at the same time there was available um, infrastructure and programs for, for the children. I, uh, I mean, what we've observed is, especially for the older children, um, is the lack of any alternative um, that drives them to the mind, uh, not just for feeding themselves, but also because there's literally nothing else around them to be engaged in uh, meaningfully. So um, definitely investment in primary education and both infrastructures and services, and uh, developing an alternative livelihood for for families. I'm not going into the details of um, regulating, better regulating the, the systems of what you call informal, formal, uh, artisanal mining to um, raise the, the level of income of the families. This would definitely also improve the um, attending rates in, in education and decrease the level of uh, child labor, definitely. Great. Um, thank you, um, Christina. Um, I think there was a question that maybe I'm going to take off my moderator's hat and tackle a little bit that came in, which is a question, I think, related to um, how the Responsible Business Alliance and its and its initiatives, how do we, how we work on, are some of our tools, are these self-assessments, or are, do we triangulate or work with research, due diligence, media, NGOs, um, and what are the criteria? I mean, just to provide a little overview, because I, I gave a very um, small um, kind of flavor of, of what we do, but yes, my the quick answer is that our work is always, we always um, collaborated with um, NGOs are working very closely with stakeholders, NGOs, media, and others to kind of um, address and sense um, emerging and pres present risk for our members across all the different areas that they operate. So clearly, we have, I would say, a kind of stepwise approach where um, companies, depending on the different things that we do, but especially when we work on the Responsible Mining Initiative, which, um, or sorry, Responsible Minerals Initiative, which 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 is really aimed at, aimed at kind of trying to get at those threats, is working very closely with. Um, with stakeholders um, so that we can figure out what's coming up. I think Cobalt's a perfect example. A couple of years ago when the amnesty report came out, um, uh, you know, since then, there's been, a, I think Christina alluded to this, but a number of initiatives formed. I mean, we're right now working on a Cobalt due diligence program um, that can help companies get some materiality, some visibility into their supply chain collectively. So so just a kind of quick answer, happy to get go down into the weeds a little bit deeper on, on, on the different levels and tools that we have. but. You know, I think uh, a very important pillar of that is working with NGOs, civil society, governments, media, you name it. 
Um, I think I right. Oh, I think I think we we um, I think we're coming in with something. So maybe I will um, I will maybe turn this one to any of the panelists that want to. I'll just pose this one to all of the panelists is to maybe uh, explain or elaborate a little bit more on, and I, and I can maybe ask Claire for this, on the difference between artisanal mining or scarce, the, the artisanal mining sector or small scale mining um, and kind of the challenges there. I know, you, I think you talked a little bit about it in your, in your, in your remarks, but maybe tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, what are some of the solutions or options um, given the fact that so many, many people are driven uh, to have to do this simply to survive. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll start with Claire, but I'll, I'll certainly allow others to maybe give their thoughts uh, on that. Sure, thanks, Carlos, and, and, and great question, because I did want to make sure we're not lumping illegal mining with um, what can be very responsible artisanal and small scale mining. Um, and I mentioned that we have a, a strategy around ASM, um, which really looks to um, to think about responsible ASM, and that's, um, that's ASM that's been legally recognized um, and that's deemed as legitimate by communities. And thinking about what are the things that we can do um, to enhance livelihoods, and, and a, a key pillar of our, of our four-pillar strategy is around thinking about alternative livelihoods. And that's much more challenging than it sounds. As we've mentioned, the ASM sector can be incredibly lucrative, um, and it's very difficult to draw people away from um, from that sort of you know get get rich quick mindset. Um, but we're but we're looking at it at different ways. So, for example, in um, Suriname, where we see a lot of ASM activity around our operations, we're thinking about whether we can move to a coexistence model. So, where we may be able to, um, for example, give up parts of our concession to responsible ASM um, and what that might look like. And there are huge challenges with that. So, so not only are there challenges around how do we make sure ASM adheres to certain standards around safety, around security, around human rights. But also, what does that mean in terms of, um, from the legal perspective and, and from any sort of, if there were to be an incident, who's liable for that? Um, and so that really requires working really um, directly with the government as well as the artisanal miners themselves. Uh, but I think we really have shifted the mindset from seeing ASM as a, as a risk internally to thinking much more about it as an opportunity to contribute to the long-term social and economic development of an area. So that's just one thing that we're, we're thinking about um, where it affects us in, in Ghana and in Suriname. Great, um, thank you. Um, just pose that one to some of our other panels. Yeah, if I may jump in here. Um, I think what, what is very important, as I was saying before, is that we often speak about the miners, but um, this is a group that is very diverse because you have um, the group of miners that are coming there within the whole family. Everybody's working there, um, also the young and adolescent children. Um, but then you have other miners that they know that they are uh, working for a person that is running the mine illegally, but they themselves are not criminal. Of course, by law, they are. Um, they are um, not following the law by by doing illegal mining activities. Um, and then there are other, of course, miners that they are involved themselves in um, organized crime activities. And I think between these two or between these three groups are even more different layers of, of people, and this is just in artisanal small-scale mining. Um, and this is also just in the area of alluvial mining. We're speaking here about alluvial mining, or I was speaking about alluvial mining in, in the Amazon region. This looks very differently, for instance, when you go to illegal mining areas, hot rock mining, um, which is a different setup, uh, different forms, socioeconomic uh, formats of, of the workers and so on. So I think it's very important to have a closer look and to not um, straight away criminalize the groups, but to pay close attention to the structures um, of the groups running these mines and then to identify if you have organized crime activities there or not.
Great. Uh, thank you, Lydia. I don't know if Christina, if you had any um, any additional thoughts on this question. Well, from the uh, perspective that we have, um, what we see as a really major gap is uh, a lack of uh, reliable, credible third-party um, audit systems. We are currently relying on, um, uh, uh, on unilateral uh, audit systems in terms of implementing the um, human rights principles or the OECD guidelines. And the lack of good systems to collect information and to provide uh, actual third party um, let's say, systems to uh, verify uh, the statements of the companies um, and of the government, of course, is really a major, major gap. And uh, since you mentioned the amnesty report came out two years ago, everybody in the field, at least in the COBA supply chain, is still struggling in getting credible um, um, reliable data on whether or not uh, child labor is growing or decreasing and um, who's actually really implementing um, the, the guidelines. Um, I don't think at the moment there's any um, reliable and independent entity that has been um, tasked to do this uh, in a strong, um, credible way. And I think that this uh, global initiative, such as the Global Battery Alliance and the Responsible Cobalt Initiative, should take this as um, an important task um, involving those agencies like UNICEF, ILO, OECD, that could provide the necessary independence to uh, support this process of monitoring. Great, thank you. Sorry, I had a microphone issue. I think we're going to do two more. Uh, I think we have two more questions. So, I mean, again, thank you for everyone. I think it's it's been a very good, um, a very good discussion. And um, I'm going to first start with one on regulations, uh, which is basically uh, to all the panelists. Um, we all know. I think I think Claire, you mentioned it. The UK Modern Slavery Act, which compels um, countries of a particular size um, that are doing. Um, some business within the United Kingdom to produce a modern slavery act. I think you mentioned Newman actually did it without necessarily being compelled. There are other pieces of regulation um, around the world uh, that are, you know, Australia is working on one. There's, there's a, the French due diligence law, and there's, there could be others. So, what is what are some of our panelists' thoughts on um, on these kinds of regulation? Is this leveling the playing field, or um, is there a risk? Because in the end, these are simply these are transparency disclosures that this could push trafficking into the shadows. In other words, people don't want to look because they don't want to find know what they find. So just you know, again, I'll maybe maybe start with any of the panelists that wants to um, take that one on. Um, Carlos, it's Claire here. I'll, um, I will start. Um, I really do think that the the UK um, Modern Slavery Act has been a real force for good and has been a very positive thing. Um, I think some of the issues we've been talking about are already in the shadows to some extent. So I don't see that as an as an immediate risk. I think any legislation that drives better transparency, better efforts around due diligence into your supply chain um, can only be a good thing. I suppose what would be challenging is if uh, various governments were putting out different um, requirements that, that were onerous on companies to adhere to. So, um, for example, any new piece of legislation that, that's coming out, um, you know, we would hope that it, it aligns to the UK um, Act or, or other pieces that are, that are already out there. Um, but but I see sensible uh, legislation um, as a good thing. Great, thank you, Claire. I, I can echo taking off my moderator's hat. That's certainly what what we feel as well as the RBA is that there's 
the importance of these things are important, and it's but it's also important to kind of try to um, work in among governments to kind of work in an efficient way. So certainly um, echo that comment. I don't know if others want to want to want to pitch in on that um, on this thought. If not, I can move to another question. Yes, I think um, here is Livia. Um, I think what also is um, is important to, of course, to have as a base is the legal framework. But I think at the moment, um, in regards to trafficking in general, we don't have a lack of legal frameworks. Um, it's quite the contrary, and which is also challenging for a company like Claire was was saying. So I think it doesn't. Um, it's not the problem to um, to create this. Um, I think it has to be more related to the situation on the ground. So of course you cannot have a legislation that is um, applicable to every um, single situation in the different regions and so on. But what I feel, especially now looking at the mining situation, is that um, there are many, many regulations and due diligence guidelines from OECD, from the LDMA, and from all the different consortiums, which are very useful. But I think sometimes for the companies that are struggling to see how they, this can be translated on the ground, because the situation in Peru is completely, completely different than the situation in, in Ghana, which is completely different to the situation in, in Colombia. So I think um, that what would be necessary is to have some, some very concrete um, and targeted um, strategies for a region when it's about the supply chain. And we have been working with um, companies or we have been working with, um, with other institutions to have a closer look on specific contacts. And I think that's the, the important thing. Great. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to move, Christina, if it's okay, to one more question, one last question, and I think we'll, what we can do concluding remarks is I think, um, as I think we're, we're coming up to the end of the hour. Um, I think one quick question, again, from all panelists about technology. What are your views on technology playing a decisive role in gathering credible info and making that available primarily at the source in terms of mining in the extractive sector. I think a lot of us have heard a lot about blockchain, which is a very intriguing and innovative um, way to record information and could potentially um, have significant impacts in this sectors or these sectors. So I, I'd love to get folks' thoughts on that. And I guess with that, we'll maybe conclude with a final remark. Maybe just go one last time around uh, technology. If I may, I also start with my last round of comments. Um, I think um, technology is something that is, is really, there is a huge potential for um, technology solutions or applications in that. Um, we do have some, some very good examples here already. Um, and I think what um, the, the tech industry is at the moment not aware of the power that they could have in mitigating the risk or giving workers um, a voice or um, working closer with um, companies together to avoid this um, violations of human or labor rights. So I think definitely there should be a much more closer cooperation with the tech industry and um, yeah, perhaps piloting this in, in some regions and then um, be able to perhaps replicate this in other areas. Uh, great, thank you, Livia. I don't know if anybody else has um, has a thought on this. Yeah, hi, it's um, it's Claire here. Um, I think it, technology can be incredibly powerful. Um, it, it's still obviously an evolving field. Um, I think there would be huge benefit in some of the traceability schemes, for example, being supported by better tech. So we see some of the. Um, bag and tag um, initiatives coming out of the DRC around the the tin um, industry, for example. I think I think anything that can support that transparency along the supply chain, um, supported by tech, could be great. And um, we're trying to sort of get our arms around what some of the blockchain um, technology might mean for us and and for our responsible sourcing strategy, which we're which we're currently developing. Um, so, you know, provided it's it's well coordinated, that 
data is reliable, it's used consistently, um, I think it could be a very useful tool. Great. Uh, Thank you. Would, Christina? Go yeah, ahead. I would agree with what has been said, although I still want to remark that um, the degree of asymmetry in sharing the information and within the, the supply chain specifically in Cobalt is so high that um, there's a real need for um, a process that is not just driven by the companies that are within the, the chain but also by um, other uh, actors to make sure that um, any kind of uh, traceability system is done in the best interest of all those involved, particularly of the communities that are um, the most vulnerable and the least capable of engaging also with more sophisticated um, technological systems. Great. Thank you, Christina. I think um, with that, maybe um, before wrapping up, uh, I think we're actually, I think, I think we've actually seen the complexities and, and the challenges um, involved in all these issues. We probably just kind of touched the tip of the iceberg um, and more things, that, plenty more discussions and collaborations that need to go forward. But maybe what I'll, what I'll stop it, I think we still have about seven minutes. I'll ask each of our panelists, and I'll start with the order with Christina again. Um, to give us maybe just their quick one-minute reflection on what they would like to see going forward to try to kind of address these issues and, you know, what is needed. So maybe if, if each of you can just take a quick wrap-up and, and what would you like to see if you could, um, and with that we can uh, close. So maybe I'll start with Christina, then Claire, and Livia. Well, from our side in the supply chain of, of Cobalt, I think it's really time that we see um, a push, a real push towards um, a serious commitment in terms of um, resources and regulatory systems that are um, reliable and credible to implement those um, policies and guidelines and standards that have already been uh, clearly articulated but are absolutely insufficiently implemented on the ground. And we cannot leave this to bilateral relationships between companies and local uh, groups, local civil society organizations. There's a need for platforms such as the initiatives that have been uh, started but do not have the teeth, let's say, to actually intervene on the ground. And so I really call for uh, the international business community, especially those involved in electronics and automotive, to um, step up and um, intervene more um, significantly and not just push the responsibility up the chain uh, to those who are, um, you know, in the upstream um, uh, of, the, of, the, of the system. Claire? Yeah, thank you. So just in terms of what's needed, I think we've talked a lot about the manifestation of, of the issue. I think we need a better understanding of some of the drivers um, that, that lead people to, to um, be exploited. So we know, for example, that poverty is a huge driver um, which prompts vulnerability. Um, and often leaves people vulnerable to abuse and exploitation, for example, if they're leaving one area and, and moving to another. Um, so we all have a role to play in reducing poverty and, and thinking about what that is from a private sector is obviously very important to us. Um, so there's the, the direct economic value that we create through um, job creation, through taxes and royalties, but also thinking about um, what are some of those programs that can contribute to the long-term sustainability of a community beyond the mining operation? So, for example, in Ghana, we have linkage um, programs around strengthening local capacity for non-mining related activities. Um, in Australia, we work through agreements with governments, um, and, and we've done um, – we've partnered with the Central Land Council around one of our operations there to develop a 10-year strategic plan. Um, thinking about how we um, we work with the Aboriginal groups there to support sustainable businesses and, and social enterprises. And I think some of those drivers around economic development um, can alleviate poverty and, and can help 
um, contribute to mitigating some of the, the challenges we see around issues like trafficking. So I'd encourage us to think about the drivers as much as the manifestation of the issue. Great, thank you. Um, Claire, Olivia, you have uh, closing remarks. <laughs> I think uh, what is really important, there are two things um, that I think should be looked at more. One thing is to have a more cross-sectoral, but also a multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder approach. So I really congratulate the private sector for for the ones being or feeling that they have to engage much more, um, and um, and to work not only with the government but also with um, community. I'm not just speaking about NGOs, but really community organizations. That means with representatives from the communities on the ground. I know that many um, companies are doing this, um, but it has to be also a multi-stakeholder um, agreement, not just as Christina was saying, just between two. Um, what I think what also has to be looked at more is um, the mining industry is very generally speaking about human rights violations, generally speaking about labor rights violations and so on. Um, but I think when we're talking about human trafficking, we have to be very specific. Human trafficking follows a pattern. Traffickers, they use um, very often the same um, dynamics, the same groups and so on. I think this um, can only be addressed when we um, also um, address it as trafficking for labor exploitation um, or human trafficking for sexual exploitation. So I think there everybody has to do a little bit more and being more concrete because then the, the answer or the response also can be more targeted to human trafficking. Great, thank you. Um, Lydia, and thank you. I'd like to thank all of our panelists and our audience for excellent, for excellent questions and for excellent remarks. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christina Bain and thank her for organizing um, this excellent webinar um, for any final comments or announcements. Christina. Thank you so much, Carlos, and thank you to our dynamic panel today for your thoughtful comments and feedback. I know I'm thinking through everything that's been discussed today, as I know many of our participants are, and just thank you for the work that each of you is doing each and every day in the field to fight human trafficking and, and look at this really, really complex issue. Uh, I want to thank our technical administration team at Babson College for, for working with us for the past two hours. I want to thank John Florendo and Avneet Kalra uh, for your work and, and helping us uh, have this conversation today. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to announce the next uh, webinar in our series. This will be the fourth webinar, uh, and it is going to be on illegal fishing, human trafficking, and wildlife trafficking, huge issue. We're already getting a lot of signups for this, so we hope you'll join us. And uh, that's going to be on Thursday, April 19th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Time or 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Central European Time. All of the webinars are recorded and they'll be featured on the RESPECT website at www.respect.international. So look for this webinar to appear in the, in the recording section uh, in the coming week or so. So thank you again to our audience for joining today and sticking with us for the past two hours. And we look forward to the next conversation. Have a great rest of the day and evening and afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs>